The First Voyage of Sinbad Long ago, in the city of Baghdad, there lived a man named Sinbad the Hamal. He made his living by lugging around heavy objects on his head. In short, he was a porter, as hard-working as he was poor. One exceedingly hot and dusty day, he was weary and sweating, and not sure if the heat or his load was causing him the most trouble. He staggered past the entrance of a wealthy merchant's house. The sight of a bench by the gates was so tempting that he could not resist setting down his load and sitting down for a while. As he rested, he felt a pleasant breeze and heard the sound of a lute playing and like voices full of laughter and song. He stood up and pushed the gates open slightly. As he peeked through them, he saw a garden full of flowers and servants carrying all sorts of rich and delicate meats. The delicious aroma greeted his nostrils and filled him with hunger. As he stood there, he recited some lines. Each morn that dawns I awake in pain and woe. I pick up my load and off to work I go. While others live in comfort and delight. With pretty song, good food and laughter light. All living things were born in their birthday suit. But some live like lords and others like brutes. At thee, O God all-wise, I dare not to rail, whose creation is just and whose justice cannot fail. When Sinbad the porter had finished his verse, he picked up his heavy crate and started to move off. Just as he put one foot forward, there came from the gate a little servant boy who tugged at his sleeve and said, Step inside, my lord wishes to meet you. The porter tried to make excuses, but the boy would have none of them, and eventually they went through the gate together. They walked through a majestic house to the grand dining room, which was full of lords sitting at tables laden with rich food and drink. The sound of music and laughter and lovely slave girls playing and singing filled the air. The diners were seated according to rank, and at the head of them all sat a man of worshipful and noble appearance. Sinbad the porter was so overwhelmed by all he saw that he said to himself, By Allah, this must be either a piece of paradise or some king's palace. He bowed down and kissed the ground. The master of the house bid him to stand up, Servants placed food before him, and the porter, after saying his bismillah, ate his fill. After which he exclaimed, Praised be Allah for your generosity, my lord. His host replied, You are most welcome, and may your day be blessed. But tell me, what is your name, and what do you do all day? Oh, my lord, my name is Sinbad the Hamal, and I carry folks' goods on my head for hire. The master of the house smiled and said, Now, if you will be so kind, let me hear those verses that you recited outside the gate of my house. The porter blushed, because he did not wish to repeat the lines about injustice among such wealthy and fortunate company. By Allah, excuse me, he exclaimed. Poverty and hardship have given me boorish ways. Tish, Tish, do not be ashamed, said the Lord. But say them again, for they pleased me when I heard you speak them at the gate. The porter duly recited the lines, and the merchant slapped his back affectionately and said, no one ever spoke a truer word. But you should know that I myself only rose to this happy state that you see all around you, after long suffering and woe. I made seven voyages at sea, 
and by each of them hangs a marvellous tale that is almost beyond belief. If you have time, I shall tell you the first of these tales, so that you can better understand what pain I endured in my early days. All this happened because of fate, for no one can escape destiny. And this is the tale of the first voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. My father was a merchant, a successful man of trade, who left me not short of wealth and comfort. I was young and headstrong and foolish, and I ate and drank and played, thinking that I'd continue that way for all my days. And then one day I awoke and found that the money was almost gone. Then I remembered my father and how he used to say, A grave is better than poverty. And I came to my senses. I sold my fine clothes, my property and my playthings. With my last three thousand dirhams, I bought merchandise for a sea voyage. As I boarded the ship with my fellow merchants, I said out loud the lines, He who seeks fame without toil and strife, the impossible seeks and wastes his life. We set sail for Basra, the city whose name means where many ways come together. We journeyed for many days and nights, touching in at ports and islands. Everywhere we landed, we bought and sold, bartered and traded, increasing our wealth bit by bit. Eventually, we came to the most beautiful island of all. Here, some seeds from the gardens of paradise must have landed and taken root. The captain dropped anchor and put down the landing planks. Everyone on board came ashore to feel the golden sand between their toes and enjoy the lush and tranquil land. Some passengers set up fires for cooking. Others washed their clothes. A few of us contented ourselves with walking around the island and then drank and played. Then, all of a sudden, the captain, standing high up on the deck, rang the ship's bell and shouted at the top of his voice, Everyone, run for your lives! May Allah preserve you! Drop your gear and get back to the ship as fast as you can! We looked up in astonishment, and as we did so, we felt the ground heaving and hoeing under our feet. The formerly calm sea swirled around the island, and great waves broke against the shore. Then the very centre of the island curled up in a great arc and those who had not made it back to the ship began to slide down into the foaming seawater. I was among them, but as I fell headlong, I grabbed hold of a wooden trough for washing clothes. This saved my life, for when I found myself in the raging water, I clambered onto it. For a while the waves tossed me to and fro as I sat astride my makeshift lifeboat, but I managed to stay afloat. I now saw that we had not landed on an island as we had thought, but on the back of an enormous whale. Somehow sand had settled on him, and trees and vegetation had grown on his back. He must have lain still for many a year. But when we landed on him, and some of us started fires, that must have annoyed him and woken him from his sleep. He flipped his tail and thrashed the water, and a great wave picked me up and washed me further still. Now I was truly on my own, with no chance of being picked up by the ship. Night fell and I prepared to meet my doom. But the morning brought me to the shore of a high-hilled island. I scrambled ashore, where I found my legs were cramped and my feet numb. I fell onto the ground like a dead man, 
and lay for a long time with my eyes closed. It was some time before I began to crawl on my hands and knees towards the edge of the woods, where I found nuts, berries and reviving spring water. Feeling somewhat better, I began to explore the island and found it to be a pleasant one. After walking some time, I caught the outline of a living thing. Drawing closer, I saw it to be a beautiful and noble horse, tethered on the beach. I stooped down and picked a clutch of long grass, still wet with the morning dew, and took it to the horse, who was a gentle and lovely mare. She nibbled it out of the palm of my hand, Then, all of a sudden, something startled her. She neighed and pulled at her rope. Looking round, I saw emerging from the waves a giant horse, a white sea stallion, who was coming for the mare. I was as startled as the mare by this impossible creature, and I ran back to the cover of the woods. From there... I saw that the stallion had taken the mare's rope in his mouth and was dragging her into the sea where surely she would drown. This sight filled my heart with pity. I picked up a stick and ran back to the beach where I began to beat the sea stallion around the head. He might surely have turned and kicked me to death, but so furious was my attack that he thought better of it and ran back into the waves from where he had come. The mare was still frisking to and fro with fright, but I took the rope and calmed her down. A few minutes later, I was joined on the beach by a man who called out to me. Who are you, and where are you from? My lord, I replied. I am Sinbad the Sailor whose ship landed on the back of a great whale, and who would have drowned had not Allah preserved me and sent me a wooden trough, clinging to which I was washed ashore here on this lovely island. And now I've told you who I am. Please return the favour and tell me who you are. He replied, I am one of the king's grooms, and I look after his favourite mare, whom you just saved from being dragged into the sea and drowned by the sea stallion. And this encounter proved to be my great fortune, for the groom led me to the capital city and the palace. Here I had the honour of meeting King Mirjan, and when I told him my story, he marvelled and said, By Allah, you have indeed been miraculously preserved. The fates must have decreed a long life for you, or you would have surely been drowned a thousand times over. You are one who is blessed by Allah for your safety. Believing me to be favoured by God, he treated me kindly. Indeed, he gave me a lucrative job as master of his port and registrar of all the ships that put in there. One day, the very same ship that I had sailed in visited the island. The captain recognised me immediately and embraced me in his arms. Your goods are still safe in the hull of my ship, he said. This was the most unexpected good news, thanks be to Allah. I offered the goods as a gift to King Mirjan, who had shown me such good favour. In return, he made me a gift of treasure that was worth twenty times its value. We sailed to Basra, where I increased the value of my goods another tenfold in the marketplace. And so I returned to Baghdad as a wealthy man. I bought this palace and many servants and set up a great establishment and soon began to forget all that I had suffered. 
This, then, is my first miraculous story. Tomorrow I shall tell you the tale of my second of seven voyages, if you will return to my house. And so saying, Sinbad the sailor gave Sinbad the porter a hundred gold coins for his time. And the porter left for his humble home, pondering his great good fortune. The Second Voyage of Sinbad My first voyage had been very profitable. I was again a wealthy man. I did not lack for luxury or entertainment. But my friend, I could not rest for long. I had tasted the salt air and the thrill of travel and adventure. Soon I was pulled by the will of Allah back to the seaport at Basra, where I found a newly made ship with fine sails and the best equipment. The captain was gathering merchants for a voyage. I booked my place with him and then went to the market to buy up goods for trade. We set sail the very next day and cruised from island to island in the fine weather. Wherever we landed, we found a crowd of merchants and clients eager to do business with us. At last, we came to a peaceful island with no sign of human inhabitants. It was a lovely place with green trees, brightly coloured birds and cool running streams. I roamed around and found a pleasant spot to eat the lunch that I'd brought with me. After I'd enjoyed my food, I allowed my eyes to close and fell into a pleasant sleep. When I awoke, I felt uneasy. I hurried back to the beach where we had come ashore. My fellow travellers had left tracks in the sand. I found the skins of fruit that they had eaten and the smoky remains of a fire that they had lit for cooking. But they themselves were gone. They had left me. I was marooned. Now I sat down on the shore and looked out to sea. All the time I expected to see our ship sail back around the headland to pick me up. But she did not. The crew and my fellow merchants had forgotten all about me. Tears came into my eyes as I thought of the life I had lost in Baghdad. My fine house, the silken cushions on my bed, the playful fountain in my courtyard, the purple rose petals of my garden, the smell of roast meat from my kitchen, my servants, the company of my friends. There was no luxury that I lacked then. Now I had exchanged all those comforts for a bed of leaves on a desert island. The tears stung my eyes. I felt that a gin had climbed inside my head and was going to drive me crazy. I had to stop all this weeping and pull myself together. Perhaps I was not as alone as I thought. After all, I had not explored the whole island. I got up and walked back to the tall tree underneath which I had slept earlier. I grabbed hold of a branch and pulled myself up onto it. Then I climbed and climbed round and round the tree until I reached the top. From there, I surveyed the island. I could not see a plume of smoke or any sign of human life but I did see some sort of strange building. A giant dome, smooth and white. This I had to examine more closely. I climbed down to the ground and walked in the direction of the dome. When I reached it, I strode all around and counted fifty paces. I ran my hands over its sides, hoping to find a secret door, but there was none that I could discover. It felt, if anything, like an eggshell. I sat down for a while, and towards evening the sky turned dark. 
At first, I thought that perhaps a large storm cloud had blown overhead. But as I looked up, I realised that the cloud was in fact a giant bird. Its wings were flapping and gusts of wind sent twigs and leaves flying this way and that. I ran to hide among the trees and saw the feathered monster descend and land on the egg. While it settled there, I recalled travellers' tales of a bird, monstrous in size, called a rock. Yes, this is indeed such a creature, I thought. I was seized by a reckless impulse. I was so desperate to escape the deserted island that I was willing to try even the maddest of ideas. I crawled out of my hiding place and crept towards the brooding bird. When I reached it, I climbed up onto its giant claw and tied myself to its leg using the cloth from my turban. There, upon the bird's foot, I spent the most uncomfortable night of my life. When morning came, the bird awoke from its slumbers and began to stretch out its gigantic wings. Then it began to flap them, causing great gushes of wind. We arose high into the air. I could see the island below me and the sparkling blue sea. Off we flew, crossing the waves, until we reached a mountainous land. I could see pointed volcanoes with plumes of smoke coming out of them. Everywhere I looked were rocks and lava. Then I began to weep. Oh, that I had stayed on the island, for at least there were fruits to eat and spring water to drink in that place. I have exchanged one terrible place for a far worse one, but... Allah in his wisdom must have willed it so, and it is the lot of man to submit to his fate. At least, I thought, my situation could not grow any more dreadful. But it did. We landed in a deep ravine. I untied myself from the bird's foot and dived behind a rock. From there, I took a look at where we had arrived. On either side of us were steep walls, far too high for any man to scale. And the bottom was home to death in the form of enormous serpents, each the size of a palm tree, who could have eaten an elephant in one gulp. Their monstrous heads with razor-sharp fangs and darting forked tongues made me shake with fear. But the ground beneath my feet held a very different wonder, one that under different circumstances would have filled me with joy. The rocks sparkled and glittered, for they were encrusted with enormous diamonds. Just one of those stones could make a man wealthy beyond his dreams. But that was back in civilization. What use were riches in this valley of death? I spent a day and a night hiding from the serpents. When darkness fell, I could see their red eyes glowing in the dark. The sight was too terrible for me and I hid inside a cave where I piled up rocks to prevent anything slivering inside. A little later, I realised that at the other end of the cave, a giant serpent was brooding on her eggs. My flesh quaked and my hair stood on end, but I raised my eyes to heaven, gave myself up to fate, and spent all that night without sleep sharing my refuge with a monster. At daybreak, I took down the rocks and staggered out like a drunken man, giddy with fear and hunger. I wandered a little way down the valley. As I walked, first one 
and then another. Huge piece of meat dropped down from the sky and landed on the rocks. Had a giant bird let them go? Then I recalled a traveller's tale of a dangerous mountain range that is full of riches. The story went that merchants would drop pieces of meat into a valley in the hope that diamonds would stick to them. They would wait for an eagle or another bird to swoop down, pick the meat and carry it to its nest. The merchants would climb up to the nest and scare away the bird by shouting and throwing sticks and stones. In this way they could recover a diamond. When I had recalled this tale, it was clear to me what I had to do. First, I filled my pockets with diamonds. Then, taking off my turban, I attached the meat to my chest. I lay and waited for a giant eagle to spot the easy meal and pick it up in its claws. When it carried the meat off to its nest, it took me with it. And so I was lifted out of the valley. When we settled down in the nest, the eagle had little time to peck at its meal, for it was soon disturbed by loud shouting and sticks and stones landing in the nest. It flapped its wings and flew off. Men approached and were surprised to see me rise up and wave my arms to greet them. My heart was filled with joy, but at first they were disappointed and angry. What trick of fate is this? said one. We risked our lives to rescue a fortune from the valley, not a man. Do not fret, I called out in happiness. My pockets are filled with enough riches to satisfy all of us. I will share them with the man who threw down the piece of meat. As we went off, I told the merchants of my adventures and all that had happened to me, and they were filled with marvel. It took us two days to walk down from the mountain range. At last, we arrived in a flat and pleasant land shaded by giant trees. The only danger was from giants with leathery skins and horns on their noses. These rhinoceroses can easily trample a man to death if they are disturbed. We managed to avoid them by staying downwind so that our scent did not carry to their nostrils. We safely reached the ship and sailed for Basra, where we sold our diamonds for a great fortune. Now, I was twice as wealthy as before, and I swore that I would never walk up the gangplank of a ship again. Oh, my friend, if only I had kept my promise. The porter was in awe of all that he had heard. The merchant gave him a hundred gold dinars and invited him to return the following evening to hear another tale, The Third Voyage of Sinbad. The following evening, the porter, whose name was Sinbad, returned to the house of the merchant, whose name he shared. Eat well, my friend, said the merchant, and I will continue to tell you how I paid for my wealth with pain and suffering. This is the story of my third voyage, and it is even more terrible than the ones that preceded it. Once again, I grew weary of luxury. I could not rest well in my soft bed of silken cushions with a belly full of fine food. Perhaps I was too restless living a life of ease, or perhaps I was too greedy for yet more gold. Gold is a tempting thing. Look around my halls. You will see it brings not only luxury, but the respect of your friends and family. I was not content. I wanted as much gold as I could get. And so, in my rashness, I took to the seas once more. 
As before, I joined a ship of merchants, and we travelled from port to port, trading here and there in cloths, spices, dried fruits, and trinkets of gold. For the first two weeks, we enjoyed fine weather. But on the fifteenth day of our voyage, a gale blew up and tossed our boat here and there. When the storm settled, we sighted land. The captain gathered us passengers on deck and said, The wind has got the better of us and driven us off course. Destiny has brought us to this shore. I fear it is a savage place. We shall soon find out the fate that Allah in his wisdom has decided for us. And he was right. For not long after, we came up close, oh, too close, to the inhabitants of that land. For here lived a tribe of apes. These creatures were not content, like most of their brethren, to live in the treetops. Instead, they carried spears and made mischief on land and sea. They dropped boats from the tops of the cliffs and jumped down into them. An armada of ape ships sailing swiftly after us. Soon, these hairy pirates were scaling up the sides of our ship. They cut the ropes of our rigging so that we could not sail. We dared not fight them, as they were too numerous. Instead, we ourselves jumped overboard and into the sea and swam for the shore. Those of us who had survived the attack gathered on the beach. We decided it was too dangerous to linger there, and we moved inland. We spied a castle on top of a hill. I roused my comrades. Brothers, let us climb up to the fortress and put ourselves at the mercy of those who live there. Whatever fate awaits us on the hill is bound to be less cruel than being torn apart by apes. The others agreed and followed me up the steep track. At the top, we walked through a massive entrance and found ourselves in an empty courtyard. We could see no living thing, though there were signs that life had been there recently. The fire still smoked, A smell of roast meat lingered in the air, and the remains of a feast of mutton lay around. We decided to lie down and rest our weary limbs. We were woken by a minor earthquake. The ground trembled, and the solid stone walls of the castle shook. Thud, thud, thud. Soon the cause of all this disturbance came through the doorway. It was a monster of a man, as tall and broad as a date tree. His eyes burned like coals of fire. His teeth were like boar's tusks, his nails like lion's claws, and his mouth gaped like a well. We ran this way and that, looking for places to hide, but there were none. He stooped down and picked me up by the arm. I dangled in front of his eyes, and he felt me as a butcher feels a sheep he is about to slaughter. But there was no meat on me. I eat little when I travel by sea, and I was all skin and bone. He put me down and picked up another of our crew. He, poor man, was fatter than I and made a nice meal for the giant. Having satisfied his stomach, he lay down and fell asleep. Stop this weeping, I said to the others. What use is it to tear at your clothes and pour dirt in your hair? Do not mourn your own deaths yet. If Allah wills it so, we shall escape an awful fate and avenge our comrade. We are not prisoners here. The door of the castle lies open. The men were in two minds. 
Which fate did they fear most? To be eaten by a giant or torn apart by apes? In the end, my view prevailed. We could not just sit and wait to be eaten for breakfast. We returned to the shore and found that the Almighty had taken pity on us. Our ship, although badly damaged, had run aground. The apes were not such great sailors after all. We worked to repair it by the light of the stars and the moon, and by the time the sky was reddening with the morning sun, we were ready to sail. The men were eager to leave that awful shore, but I burned for revenge. Let us hurry back to the castle, I said. We may yet catch the criminal asleep. Here is my plan. We will sharpen two sticks and harden them in the fire. If God is willing, we shall have justice for our comrade's life. Again, the men were of two minds what we should do. But their thirst for justice proved stronger than their love of life. We returned to the castle, where we found the monster still slumbering. We split into two teams and made our weapons in the embers of the fire. Then, moving together, we approached the sleeping giant and plunged our spears into his eyes. He awoke with a terrible roar and stumbled around the cave, shrieking fearfully and groping around the ground, hoping to find us. We wasted no time in slipping out of the castle and running as fast as we could in the direction of the beach. Thanks to the will of he who directs everything, we reached our boat safely and set sail. Three giants stood on the cliffs and threw giant boulders down into the sea. Our ships were buffeted by powerful waves, but we got away safely. By mid-morning of the following day, we spied land, and thanking the Almighty for his mercy, we stumbled ashore. But fate had allowed us to escape one peril, only to face a far worse one. Once ashore, we discovered fresh water and fruit, but soon danger found us. A huge serpent dropped down from a tree and entwined itself around one of our men. We attacked the monster with knives and rocks, but its grip was too terrible. Then, Still more giant serpents slithered out of the bushes. In terror, we ran this way and that, but the woods were full of these abominable and viperish monsters. Darkness was falling, and I could not find my way back to the beach. I could not rest in the open, for fear of being crushed by a serpent. I decided to build a shelter and began to cut down branches from the trees. I used the wood to build a kind of cage around myself, and inside this I managed to get some rest for the night. When morning came, I lifted the cage up and walked down along the path, still safe from the serpents inside my wooden suit of armour. I only discarded my cage when I reached the beach, and then, looking out to sea, I saw my salvation. The sail of another ship. How I jumped for joy, waved my arms and called out, until at last they spotted me and set down a small boat. Two sailors rowed ashore and rescued me. Thanks be to Allah. On board, I told my story and all of my remarkable adventures to the captain. At the end of my tale, he looked at me and said, Truly your story proves the greatness of Allah. At first, I did not recognise you. Such is the sorry state that you are in, worn down by suffering. But now I see that I know you. You are Sinbad, who travelled on our ship, and whom we lost. As you described in the story of your second voyage, we set sail without you. 
When we realised our mistake, we debated whether or not we should divide up your merchandise between us, but I ruled that we should keep it. All your goods are safe in the hold of the ship. From that day on, my journey and my business went well. We bought and sold wherever we went. I built up a stock of cloves and ginger and all manner of spices. And thence we fared on to the land of Sindh, where also I sold them at a great profit. Then we set sail again. With a fair wind and the blessing of Almighty Allah, we arrived safe and sound at Basra. I had gained on this voyage what was beyond count and reckoning. I gave freely to widows and orphans out of thanks for my happy return. Then fell to feasting and making merry with my friends and forgot all the hardships that I had suffered. Then Sinbad the seaman gave Sinbad the porter a hundred gold dinars. The porter, after taking his gold, passed the night in his own house, wondering at what his namesake, the seaman, had told him. The Fourth Voyage of Sinbad from the A Thousand and One Nights The following night, there was again feasting and merriment inside the house of Sinbad the merchant. He spoke to his namesake, the porter, and said, You see all around you that my house is bright and full of fun and laughter. When you have heard the story of my fourth voyage, you will know that in order to reach this happy state, I had to crawl through a grim place more dead than alive. Once again, I journeyed down to the port of Basra and boarded a merchant ship. We sailed through the Straits of Hormuz and beyond. As before, we sailed from place to place, doing brisk and profitable business. Then one day, the wind blew against us and the captain cast out his anchors and brought the ship to a standstill, fearing lest she should founder in mid-ocean. Then we all fell to prayer and humbling ourselves before the Most High. But as we did, we were hit by a furious squall, which tore the sails to rags and tatters. The anchor cable snapped, and the ship rolled this way and that, until we were cast into the sea, goods and all. The waves washed some of us ashore, almost dead with weariness and lack of sleep, cold, hungry, thirsty and fearful. And so we walked about the island until we came to the gate of a fine house. A number of men came out. They did not speak our language, but they bowed and greeted us in a way that was welcoming and not at all threatening. We believed that we had been fortunate. They led us through gardens and courtyards and into a great hall where they presented us to their king. He too proved to be most courteous and friendly and signalled to us to sit down at the table. Servants brought plates full of delicious fruits and bread and placed them before us. Our men began to eat, but they had forgotten their good manners. They could not help themselves, but they greedily grabbed more and more food with their hands and stuffed it into their mouths. They chomped and slathered like animals. This rude behaviour was most unusual in them. It was as if they had been possessed by an evil spirit. Our hosts did not seem to mind. They brought coconut milk. And when the men had drunk this, they became still more greedy. Only after they had eaten enough to burst did they eventually cease to gobble the food. Now sated and drowsy, they allowed themselves to be led out to a pen where they were kept like cattle. For the next few weeks, they wandered amongst the trees 
and rested at will, growing fatter and fatter. But I, who had no interest in this animal behaviour, wasted away with lack of food and fear. I had by now realised the true intention of our hosts. We had fallen into the hands of cannibals. The men were being fattened up to be eaten. But one day, when the shepherds drove the men out into the fields to graze, an old shepherd saw that I was standing apart from them. I understood from the look in his eye that he would make no objection if I made my escape. In fact, he pointed me the way to go. I left and found a road which I followed for several days. I walked and walked and lived on berries and herbs. Thanks to Almighty Allah for all his favours, I eventually saw the walls of a magnificent city. When I was close to the city, I fell in with some travellers who asked my name and where I was from. When they heard how I had escaped the cannibal's farm, they marvelled and said that my story proved the greatness of Allah. Fate had once again favoured me, for these people were well connected and promised to introduce me to their king. We entered the city, and I was impressed by the fine houses, the prosperous people, and the markets well stocked with food. I saw that all the citizens, great and small, rode fine horses, high-priced and thoroughbred, but oddly, they lacked saddles. Well now, I thought, these people lack for nothing but a comfortable seat to travel on. I see a gap in the market, a fine opportunity for a man of business to make money. When I met the king, he received me kindly. I told him my story, and he listened with great interest and amazement. When I had finished, he asked me my station in life in the city of Baghdad. Sire, I am a merchant, I said. When I am at home, I have a quiet life and have a great many friends. But let me say, I have an idea to remain in your fine city and set up a business. I have noticed how your citizens ride horses but make no use of saddles. Saddles? asked the king. What are they? I described the leather seat and the equipment that we used to ride a horse in comfort, and His Majesty was most interested. Indeed, he asked if I could make one to show him. I answered that I would gladly do so. I sought out a clever carpenter to make the frame, and a tanner to produce a comfortable leather seat and fine reins, and a blacksmith to hammer out the stirrups and bit. Moreover, I made beautiful fringes of silk. I presented the work to the king and demonstrated how to make use of it to ride a horse. He was greatly impressed by the comfort of this arrangement, so much less bruising than riding bareback. He paid me a fine price for my equipment and his officials and all the nobility in the land wished to imitate him. A great number of wealthy people ordered saddles and horse equipment from me, and I soon became quite wealthy. One day, the king called me to his office and said, Your industry and business have improved the quality of life in our city. I have in mind to reward you with a beautiful and wealthy wife so that you will wish to stay in our country and continue your work. So he summoned the Prime Minister and witnesses and married me straightway to a lady of a noble family, the flower of an ancient race of beauty and grace and the owner of farms and estates 
and many houses. I said to myself, when I return to my native land, I will take her with me. But I should not have tempted fate, for no one knows what destiny has in store for them. From then on, my ease and prosperity, already great, continue to grow. Then, about a year after I was married, ill fortune struck my neighbour's house. My friend, who lived next door, lost his wife to illness. He was beside himself with grief. I said to him, Do not mourn for your wife, who has now found the mercy of Allah. The Lord will surely give you a better one in her place, and your life shall be happy, prosperous and long, God willing. But the man could not be comforted. You are a stranger here, he said. You do not yet know all our ways. This very day they bury my wife. They will bury me with her in the same tomb. It is our custom that if a man dies first, his wife is buried with him. And if a wife dies first, her husband is buried with her. And then I understood why my neighbour could not be consoled. The women of the house dressed the wretched man's wife in her finest clothes and decked her in her richest jewellery with gold and diamonds. Later that day, soldiers took husband and wife on their last journey to the tomb. They set aside a great stone and first lowered her down into it. Then they placed a rope of palm fibres under the husband's armpits and let him down into the cavern. With him, a great pitcher of fresh water and seven pieces of bread. I asked the people who were gathered around, and uh, if the wife of a foreigner like myself were to die among you, would, would you do the same to him as, as you have done to this man? And they replied that assuredly they would do just the same to me, for it was the custom of the place. I feared greatly when I heard those words, but I remained in my comfortable house with my agreeable wife. Then, a few months later, she sickened and took to her bed. I prayed to Allah, who is merciful, for her to get better soon. But her illness took a turn for the worse, and she passed away. As soon as the doctor let it be known that my wife was gone to the next world, soldiers came to fetch both her and me. I cried out, the Almighty Allah never made it lawful to bury the living with the dead. They took no notice of my protests but tied me up by force and let me down into the cavern with a large jug of water and seven loaves of bread, according to their custom. At the bottom of the dark pit, I said to myself, what curse was upon me to take a wife in this city? There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah the glorious, the great as often as I escape from one calamity, I fall into a worse. I looked around at the grim tomb and its grimmer contents. Even in this terrible place, the will to live was strong inside my heart. I resolved to eat and drink as little as possible to prolong my life. And so, I lived in the darkness among the bodies, not knowing how many days and nights had passed. Groping in the dark, I found collars and necklaces of pearls and jewels and trinkets of gold and silver set with precious stones and other ornaments and valuables that were worn by the deceased. I gathered this fortune and piled it into my turban. But what use was this fortune to me here, below ground, in the tomb? 
but it was not my fate to die there. For eventually, I heard a rustling and a scurrying. I realised that some animal, perhaps a fox or a dog, had found its way down into this grim place, and if it could get in, it must surely be able to get out. I followed its sound, crawling and wriggling on my belly like a worm. I made my way through a tunnel, until eventually I saw a chink of light. This gave me strength to crawl faster. The hole was just big enough for a skinny man such as myself to get through. And then I found myself on the shore of the sea. I gulped in the fresh air and covered my eyes from the blazing sun. I gradually opened them, adjusting to the light. When I could see once again, I spotted a ship at sea. I took a piece of white stroud I had with me and tying it to a stick, ran along the seashore making signals therewith and calling to the people in the ship until they noticed me and hearing my shouts sent a boat to fetch me. The captain and the crew received me kindly and listened in awe of my return from the land of the dead. I travelled with them to Basra via the islands of Bell, Kala and Hind. When I reached home, I had once again added to my wealth, thanks to the rich ornaments of the dead that I had brought with me. I gave freely to beggars, widows and orphans, and still had plenty left over for a life of ease. Then I gave myself up to pleasure and enjoyment, returning to my old merry mode of life. The Fifth Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor You may say that I am prone to make the same mistake over and over again. I return from a trip, happy just to be alive and to see my loved ones. I settle into my old ways of feasting and comfort. Then, as time goes by, my memory plays a cruel trick on me. It reminds me of the thrill of travel and business and forgets the cruel string of suffering. So it happened a fifth time that I set out on a voyage. At the port of Basra, I walked along the quay looking for a ship that was tall and in good shape. I found one that was pleasing to my eye. As I was already a rich man, I was able to buy it. Next, I hired a captain and crew. The men loaded my goods onto the ship, and other merchants paid me to use the space that was left over. In this way, I was guaranteed to make a good sum of money even before I set sail. We sailed over Allah's Pond, from city to city, from island to island, from sea to sea. All the way we were in good cheer, rejoicing in the profits that we were making. There is no greater sport than haggling in the marketplace and striking a good bargain. Both sides argue furiously over the price, joshing and pleading, throwing up their hands, begging and accusing, pretending to have hurt feelings, and at the end they laugh and smile and make the exchange, each convinced that they have had the better side of the deal. Goods and money change hands everywhere that people can count on their fingers. And so our journey prospered, until one day we reached a small island floating in the sea. I did not have any particular interest in this deserted place, and I remained below deck. Some of the merchants were curious to investigate an unusual rock on the shore. It lay half buried in the sand, the top half forming a great white dome. 
when they ran their hands over its smooth surface, it fell to them like an egg. They bashed it with stones until it cracked open and water gushed out. Inside, they found a giant chick, which soon made a fine dinner. The smell of the roast meat met my nostrils as I lay in my bunk, and I heard the merry merchants as they made a party of it. I got to my feet and waded ashore, keen to join the feast. When I saw the broken eggshells and the giant roast chick, I fell down on my knees and cried, In the name of Allah the Merciful and the Great, we are doomed. Do you not realise what you have done? You have killed the young of a rock, a monstrous bird who will soon return and reap vengeance for this folly. We splashed through the surf, reboarded our ship and set out for the open sea. We had not got far before we saw the silhouette of a giant bird that held a great boulder in its talons. He dropped this load so that it landed by the side of our ship. The waters opened to reveal the bottom of the sea and down we slid into the great trough before being tossed up again onto the foaming summit of a mountainous wave. Our ship was not sunk until a second, larger bird dropped a stone that cut through the deck, and now we were ruined. I swam for my life among the surging surf and grabbed hold of a piece of wreckage. A while later, by permission of the Most High, I was washed ashore, half drowned, on the beach of another island. I found myself in a kind of paradise, home to sweet-smelling flowers, delicious low-hanging fruit, and birds singing the praises of the one who is eternal. A mossy bank was my pillow for the night, by the side of a stream. In the morning, when I awoke, I saw, sitting not far from me, an old man dressed in a skirt of palm leaves. He made signs, as if begging me to pick him up on my shoulders and carry him across the water. I thought to myself, I may profit in heaven if I help this old man. And I did as he asked, and let him climb onto my shoulders. I waded across the water, and knelt down to let him clamber back onto the ground. But he did not leave my shoulders. Instead, he wrapped his leathery legs around my neck, half strangling me. I was finding it hard to breathe, and for a moment the world went black to me and I lost consciousness. I came round a few moments later and felt the old man still on my shoulders, now kicking my sides. The pain forced me to rise again to my feet. Then he pointed for me to take him among the fruit trees so that he could reach up and grab whatever he wanted to take and eat. If ever I refused to do his bidding, he beat or strangled me into submission. For some days I carried my burden around the island. At night I slept with him still entwined around my neck. There was nothing I could do to shake him off, try as I might. I was growing weaker by the day and I began to curse my own kindness. By Allah! As long as I live, I shall never do a free favour for another man again. My only thought was to help this fellow, and he has repaid me with suffering. Soon I was begging the Most High that he bring an end to my stress and weariness and let me die. But he who is glorious and merciful had a different plan for me. It happened one day that we came to a part of the island where the ground was covered by gourds. These were large fruits with hard outer skins. An idea came to me to relieve my pain. I broke open a number of these gourds and scooped out the flesh of the fruit to make them into cups. Then I gathered some grapes that grew nearby and placed them inside the gourds, 
and pulverised them with a rock. After leaving these vessels in the sun for a few days, they fermented and turned into strong wine. One evening I drank from them. My pain lessened and I lost my reason. I began to sing, clap my hands and jig around from one foot to the other with the old man on my back. The old man tapped me on the shoulder. Understanding what he wanted, I handed a gourd of wine up to him. He too drank from it and began to get merry. Soon he demanded another and another and I obliged until eventually the wine got the better of him and he fell asleep. For the first time in weeks I felt that the grip of his legs around my neck had loosened. Taking my chance, I tossed the devil off my shoulders and onto the ground. The first use I made of my freedom was to find a great rock and use it to kill him while he slept. No mercy of Allah be upon him. I then returned to the shore with a heart full of happiness and relief, reciting praise to the Almighty, who in due course brought a ship into sight. I signalled furiously to the sailors and was soon saved from that accursed paradise of an island. When I told the captain the story of all that had happened there, he said, He who rode on your shoulders is called Sheikh al-Bahir, the old man of the sea, and none who has ever felt his legs on their neck has come away alive. He has eaten all who died below him. Praise be to Allah for your safety. The captain transported me freely to the next island, where the capital is known as the City of the Apes. Here, even the strong walls of the city do not protect the people from an uncomfortable fate. Every evening, when it grows dark, apes come down from the trees and invade the city. To avoid them, the people have no choice but to leave their houses and sleep in boats. It was my good fortune to fall in with some business-minded folk who showed me how they made the best of this ill luck. Every day they collected pebbles on the beach and then stepped a little way into the forest and pelted the apes who lived in the trees. The apes responded by throwing back coconuts. This battle of stone and coconut took place every day. But the trade was fair, because the people picked up the fruit and took them to sell in the market. I joined in in this amusing but dangerous sport, and Allah permitted me to make a fair profit day after day, until I had massed a good sum of money. When I was once again well off, I hired a passage on a passing ship. While travelling on my way back, I traded my gold for pearls and made an even greater profit. By the time I reached the welcome port of Basra, I had amassed a fifth fortune to add to my others. The Sixth Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor The next morning, Sinbad the Porter prayed the dawn prayer before setting off for the mansion owned by his namesake, Sinbad the Sailor. The wealthy Sinbad wished the poor Sinbad a good day and invited him to sit and listen to the story of his sixth voyage. My soul yearned for travel. I had all the riches that anyone could need, but I still loved the satisfaction of making a good deal and adding to my pile of treasure. Besides, living in luxury and comfort has the disadvantage of following the same pattern every day. Like this silk cushion that I rest my arm on. Soft and comfortable, yes, but thrilling, no. Once again, I made the great mistake of packing up my goods and heading to the port of Basra. I boarded a good ship and travelled with other merchants from island to island, trading here and there. 
it seemed to us merchants that fortune was smiling on us. But then, one day, after a particularly long voyage, the captain came up onto the deck, knelt down on his knees, and began wailing and plucking out his beard, crying out, Oh, alas, for my children will be orphans! We had no idea what was troubling him. One merchant asked, Captain, what is troubling you? We have wandered off course and sailed into seas that are unknown to me. I have not the least idea where we are. We shall never find our way home, he wailed. This was not welcome news, and things went from bad to worse. A sailor called out from the top of the mast, Look out! Rocks ahead! Hearing this, the captain wailed even louder, saying, No man can prevent what is preordained by fate. By Allah, we have come to a place of sure destruction and not one of us can be saved. And as if answering him, the winds whistled and whirled. Our ship spun around three times and its hull was ripped apart on a rock. We were all plunged into the sea. Many of us drowned but I was one of those who survived. Bedraggled, covered in cuts and bruises and half dead with exhaustion, I managed to scramble up onto the rocks that were strewn with the wreckage of many a ship that had been dashed to pieces before ours. Now all over this island, precious stones were lying around like pebbles The stream bed sparkled with diamonds. I picked up handfuls of royal pearls as easily as gravel. On the beaches and in the surf of the sea, we found ambergris, the floating gold that is made in the bellies of sea monsters and spewed up by them. The other merchants went crazy, wandering here and there, praising the works of Allah and gathering as many precious things as they could carry. But nowhere could we find anything more than a few wild herbs and grass to eat. Over time, we became weaker and weaker. It was not long before all my companions had died. I was angry with myself for my folly, What need had I for this sixth adventure, when I already had more money than any man could need for his luxury and comfort? Eventually, Allah sent me a thought to explore the island further, to see if there would be any inhabitants who somehow had discovered a way to live here. After staggering some way, I came across a river, which provided me with an easy way to travel. I bound together some logs and made a raft. This I loaded with precious goods and the little food that I could find. As I set sail, I recited the poem. Fly, fly across the seas, follow fate in the salty breeze. Trust in yourself and in no other. Land after land you shall discover. Fret not for your life when you sleep at night, for all will pass when the time is right. The waters carried me along, past woods and rocky plains, until eventually it passed into a tunnel that ran straight through a wall in the rock. I ducked my face down into the boat and was carried into the darkness feeling the roof brush against my turban as we went. I began to wonder if my raft would become stuck deep inside the mountain and I should never see day again, until all of a sudden my eyes were filled again with the light of heaven. The stream had flowed out into the open. Some people had seen me and were calling out. One of them threw me a rope, which I grabbed, and they hauled me onto the bank where I fell down exhausted. 
They spoke a language which I did not understand, until one of them said in Arabic, Peace be upon you, brother. They were good men, workers in the field. They carried me, my boat, and the precious gems that were stored on it to the palace for an audience with the king. I offered up my store of treasure as a gift to his majesty, the king of Sri Lanka, and told him my story from beginning to end. He asked me about my own country, and when he had heard all I had to say, he proclaimed, Your caliph is wise and praiseworthy. You have made me admire him by all you have said. I wish you to return to Baghdad and take greetings and gifts to him. I lived in great honour in the palace of the king, until one day I heard that a company of merchants was fitting out a ship to set sail for Basra. The king paid my passage, loaded a rich cargo on board, and gave me a letter for Caliph Harun al-Rashid. He said to me, Carry this with your own hand to the commander of the faithful, and give him many greetings from us. I hear and obey, I replied. The letter was written on fine deer skin, in ink of ultramarine, and read, Peace be upon you from King Al-Hind, who commands a thousand elephants, each bedecked with a thousand diamonds. You are a brother to us, and a sincere friend. We are sending some trifling gifts in the hope that you shall be pleased to accept. The gifts included a cup of ruby, a yard high, filled with precious pearls, the skin of a serpent that had swallowed an elephant, and whosoever sat upon it should never grow sick. A ton of sweet-smelling perfumes, and a beautiful dancing girl who shone like the moon. We set sail with a fair wind, and thanks be to Allah, may he be praised and exalted, we arrived safely in Basra, from where I travelled to Baghdad, the city of peace, where I requested an audience with the caliph. He asked me, Sinbad, is it true what he writes? I kissed the ground before his feet and replied, Majesty, it is true and much more. For state processions, his throne is set upon a huge elephant, and men with golden javelins walk before and after him. He is followed by a thousand horsemen in gold brocade and silk. The caliph was pleased with all that I told him, and only permitted me to return to my home after he had bestowed on me many honours, rich gifts and favours. I distributed presents among my own friends and family and gave help to the poor. Then I returned once again to my old life of comfort and feasting. When Sinbad had finished telling the story of his sixth voyage, he gave a gold coin to his namesake, Sinbad the Porter, and they agreed to meet again the following morning to hear the seventh and final voyage of the merchant's career. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my channel, English Learning Audio Bar. Today we will listen to The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad the Sailor. After my return from my sixth voyage, which brought me a fine profit, I returned to my old life of enjoyment and fun. I continued this way for some time, until I began to long once again to sail the seas, visit foreign countries, make friends among like-minded merchants, and experience new things. So having made up my mind, I packed up my merchandise and had it taken down to the port of Basra. I found a company of merchants with a ship ready for sea. I set sail with them, made friends, and travelled in health and safety with a fair wind in our sails. Eventually, we came to a city called Madinat al-Sin, where we did good business. After we sailed on from the city, a violent headwind blew up, 
and rain started to drench our ship and our goods. We covered everything with canvas and prayed to the almighty Allah to save us from danger. When the storm had passed, the captain climbed up to the top of the mast. He looked right and left and then began beating his own forehead with his fist. We cried up to him, Captain, what is the matter? And he replied, saying, Say goodbye to one another and recite the prayer for those who are about to die. The wind has got the better of us and has driven us to the furthest corner of the world. Then he climbed down, opened his sea chest and took out a book which he read for a while with tears in his eyes. Eventually he said to us, This book describes exactly where we have come to. It is a place from which there is no escape and we shall surely die here. It is called the Sea of the King. For here Solomon, son of David, peace be on them both, is buried beneath the waves. Great sea serpents live here, so massive that they can eat a ship whole. On hearing the captain's words, we were filled with wonder and dread and began to commit our souls to Allah. Before long, we heard a terrible roar like thunder and we were struck with terror. A huge fish came up to us, as tall as a mountain, and we became wild with fright and made ready for death. Then, a second later, another, still more monstrous fish reared its head. Neither serpent made a move to attack us, though we might have died of fright. Finally, a third fish appeared out of the water, and soon there were three fishes circling around our ship. We were stupefied and lost the power of reason. The third and biggest fish opened his mouth. We looked into its jaws that were wider than the gate of a city. We beseeched the Almighty for help, when suddenly a violent squall of wind hit the ship which rose up out of the water and landed on a reef. It broke into pieces, and everyone and everything on board was plunged into the sea. I rode on a plank with my legs astride it like a horse. The winds and waters played sport with me and threw me up and down. Then I cried out to myself, Oh, Sinbad, oh, seaman, you have not learned the lessons of your sufferings and hardships. You have not given up sea travel. You have sworn to give it up, but you lied, and now you deserve this suffering and you must endure it with patience. All this is decreed by Allah, whose name be exalted, to turn me from my greed of gain. This greed is the cause of all I suffer. There is no need, for I have wealth galore. I soon returned to my senses and said, In truth, this time I most sincerely repent to the Most High of my lust for gain and venture, and never again shall I travel, not even in my thoughts and dreams. I continued like this for two days, until at last, I landed on an island where I ate fruit and drank fresh water. And it was here I said to myself, He who ties the knot of fate can untie it equally well. And so I walked about until I found a great river of sweet water. As I had done once before, I tied together some logs of balsa wood and made myself a raft. For several days I lay on my boat, not eating or drinking, until I was as weak and giddy as a chicken. Eventually, I passed through a valley, at the end of which I could hear the sound of water crashing down a great fall, and I feared that I would be carried over its edge and smashed to pieces on the rapids. 
I cried. There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious, the great. I was in such despair that this was my end that I did not notice a fisherman cast down his net. He caught me in it and hauled me up onto the bank. I found myself looking up at a crowd of people who had come down to the river from a great city. One of these, an elderly gentleman, richly dressed, helped me to my feet and led me to the city. He bought me a fine set of clothes and paid for me to visit the steam baths. Then he invited me to his house and set rich food before me. At the end of the evening, I retired to a set of rooms and servants were told to bring me anything I wished for. I stayed in my rooms for three days, eating and drinking well and restoring my health and mind. On the fourth day, my host came to me and said, Praise be to Allah for your safety. Will you come to the market with me and sell your goods and take their price? I was puzzled and asked what these words meant, for I had lost all my goods in the shipwreck. He told me not to worry, and so we went together to the market. There I found his servants had brought my raft and put it up for sale. One man offered a hundred silver pieces for it, and my host offered me one hundred and fifty. He pressed me to accept his offer, which I did most gratefully, for it was not worth one silver piece in my mind. When we returned home, he said to me, I am a very old man and have no son, but I have a daughter who is young and ready to marry. The Most High has smiled on you by saving you seven times from the sea. In all my long life I have not heard of another man who has survived more than three shipwrecks. Would you do me the honour of taking her to be your wife? I was silent and made no answer, for his generosity was great. But he continued to press me and say that he wished for nothing greater than this. And so at last I accepted. I was married to his daughter and her father arranged for a noble wedding feast. I found her perfect in beauty and character, and she was dressed in rich clothes, covered with precious ornaments and gems worth a mint of money. We lived happily together for some years, until her father passed to another world. Peace be upon him. After I became the head of the household, I began to know the other city folk more closely and I discovered that they had a secret. Once a month, their forms altered, and they changed into birds. I asked a man who was a friend to me, Next time this happens, carry me upon your back, so that I too may know what it feels like to fly. This cannot be, he replied, but I did not cease to ask him, until at last he agreed to do as I wished. I climbed on his back, and he took me so high that I heard the angels glorifying God in the heavens. I was greatly thrilled and called out, Praise be to Allah in his perfection! No sooner as I said these words, than a great fire came from heaven, and the birds scattered this way and that. My carrier cursed my name and dropped me on top of a mountain. Here I met two young men carrying rods of gold. I saluted and salamed them and asked who they might be. We are the servants of Allah Most High, they replied. They gave me a rod of gold and walked by my side along a ridge on the edge of the mountain. We heard the cries of a man. Save me, and Allah will save you from all your troubles, he called out. The next moment, a great serpent came into view. The monster had already half swallowed the man. His head and the top part of his body were still sticking out of his mouth, and he was calling out to me. I rushed down and beat the serpent's head with my golden rod, 
until it released its victim and fled. We continued along our way together, until at last we found a group of men birds. One of these agreed to carry me back to the city. My wife met me, rejoicing in my safety, and told me to beware of flying with the bird folk, for they were related to devils and did not know how to mention the name of Allah the Almighty, which was why the fire had come down against us. I did not wish to remain any longer in this city, and so we sold all our property for a fine sum of money and boarded a ship back to Basra, from where we travelled safely to Baghdad. When my friends and family heard of my return, they welcomed me and marvelled with great joy for I had been away for an entire twenty-seven years. Then I forswore travel before Allah the Most High, and I will journey no more, for this seventh and last voyage had shown me enough of earth and the skies. I thank the Lord, may he be praised and glorified, for bringing me back to my family, friends and home country. Sinbad the sailor spoke to Sinbad the porter and said, So now you have heard what dangers and hardships I went through to become a man of wealth and leisure. Allah bless you, my lord, replied the porter. Pardon me for my words that wronged you. And the two Sinbads remained friends and enjoyed the delights of life until their last days on earth. And that was the story of the final voyage of Sinbad.